a welcome to this webinar, which is a joint production of Asset Herzog and of our friend, good friend, Talia Townsend from the US law firm of Wigan and Dana. Um, we decided to hold this event because of a, a, a chain of recent US government uh, um, uh, orders, regulations, and other documents, all of which are potentially relevant for Israeli financial institutions, and that's where you come in. Now, what we are planning on doing to, uh, over the next uh, 55 minutes is the following. I will give a brief overview of the situation. Uh, then I will hand over to Tanya, who will go a bit deeper, and she actually has a PowerPoint presentation, which she may or may not use to help her navigate through the complex issues. And then we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. So with that introduction, let me first start by saying that obviously this is a very difficult period for all of us. The war has been now ongoing for, what is it? We're nearing the five month mark. Um, and if there's one thing that all of us have learned over the last four and a half, five months is the real importance of the relationship between Israel and the United States. It's not just the fact that the US sent two aircraft carrier groups to deter Hezbollah in Iran. It's not just the constant stream of weapons and ammunition which have been flying to Israel from the US on a daily basis. It's not just the US support in the UN Security Council which has prevented uh, 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 dozens of anti-Israeli decisions. It's all of that plus the fact that we have realized that without the big brother, we probably can't exist in this region. Um, that being said, it won't come as a surprise to the Israeli audience that the relationship between the Israel and the United States has become more and more complicated over the last several months. Um, there are at least four different reasons for this. I won't be political, so but I'll get close to it. So for <laughs> those of you who are sensitive, please close your ears. Um, first of all, obviously, uh, it's the fact that the current administration has elements in it who are not friendly to the state of Israel. Secondly, because the Democratic Party has at its left side a lot of anti-Israeli elements. Uh, third, the upcoming elections in November in the United States. And fourth, the activities of the Israeli government and the statements of some of its ministers, all of these in combination have created, let's say, tense relationship between the two administrations. One of the results of this complicated relationship, which on the one hand, the president of the United States himself has pledged to support Israel in the war and do everything in his power to help us. And on the other side, a lot of elements in his own administration and party are saying Israelis are going crazy, uh, is that the current administration appears to have adopted a carrot and stick approach towards Israel. So while on the one hand, they just passed in Congress a bill for 14 point something billion dollars continued support for Israel, which is still stuck because the Senate won't take it up. Uh, on the other hand, they have issued uh, 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 a chain of new orders and regulations, which at best I can call unfriendly, and uh, on, on, on other days I could say even hostile. And that combination is probably going to be what we're going to be seeing for the near future. Now, I can tell you that because I talk to the Israeli government, the music in the Israeli government is, we need to survive the next eight months until the elections, and hopefully the other party will win and everything will be great again. Um, however, we in the private sector do not have the luxury of adopting such a policy because we are already feeling the real life consequences of some of these American actions. And that is why we are gathered here today to talk about primarily two of the four recent developments in this area. The first issue we will talk about, which will be the focus of most of what we're talking about, is actually unrelated to Israel at all. It was issued on the eve of December of Christmas last year, and it's the new executive order uh, uh, focusing on foreign financial institutions, which you are, of course, some of. Uh, 
the foreign financial institutions, and this is all Russia sanctions related. Um, this is more Russia sanctions, but in my opinion, it's important primarily because of two issues. One, because the uh, American, uh, the U.S. government has actually just said formally, foreign banks and foreign financial institutions, we are looking at you and we are waiting for an opportunity to catch you. And it won't be nice when we do so. And it's a direct threat. The second important change for me is that the threat says, and we don't care that the U.S. gets it. If it's something we don't like, we will go after you. And the combination of these two is scary. And I will ask Talia to elaborate and give her thoughts on should we be concerned, etc. cetera. Um, the second package is a, is a series of three separate new orders and, and, and documents issued within one week by the administration at the beginning of February. And the three are an executive order relating to settler violence, which all of us have heard, of you have heard of. Um, uh, the Secretary of State issued an, a, a, a notice that they will have the option of uh, canceling US visas for people active in the offensive cybersecurity or spyware world. And third, the president issued the memo, the US president issued the memo saying that countries receiving weapons from the United States, such as Israel, need to give within 45 days clarifications on why they are using the weapon, how they are using the weapons lawfully and not violating international law and not violating human rights and allowing humanitarian aid. And while the Israeli flag was not formally placed on that memo, I cannot think of any other country in the world currently, except maybe Ukraine, where this could be relevant. So I think it was drafted specifically for us. Now, the, for the Israeli banks of the three new Israeli-related orders, the one which theoretically is the only one you should care about is the one which designated four new SDNs, four specific Israeli individuals. By the way, to the best of my knowledge, only three of them are actually settlers. One of them lives in Israel. But we are not un, uh, uh, aware of the, of the SDN category. In fact, all of the Israeli banks, or most of them have already dealt with Israeli designated SDNs. And every bank has come up with its own methodology to deal with this. So I don't think this is the issue for us. I think the issue is that this is the first time an executive order has been issued, which is specifically focused on Israel, which is a very unfriendly act. Um, and that leads me to the real question is, should we do anything different from what we've been doing as a result of everything I just described? Um, until today, our advice to all of you has been that when you have a potential U.S. sanctions event, we should distinguish between three scenarios. Scenario number one is uh, the clear violation of U.S. sanctions, and uh, 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 they apply to the situation. So it's an event which falls within the substance of the U.S. sanctions. The second scenario is it's an event which would be prohibited for a U.S. company, but it is not prohibited for formally for third countries, but there is a U.S. nexus to the event. And this has always been tricky, and every organization has adopted different approaches to these situations, some taking more risks than others, some taking less. And the third scenario is it's an event which would be prohibited for a U.S. company, but there is no U.S. nexus at all. And on this, I have to tell you, practice in Israel amongst companies has been very varied in this situation. Some have adopted the approach saying they, it's not a violation of U.S. sanctions at all because it's only prohibited. For example, a prohibition on importation into the U.S. of something uh, 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 is only a prohibition on the importation to the U.S. The U.S. government, even the U.S. government did not mean that you are not allowed to buy it in Israel. 
However, if there was no U.S. nexus, we would always say, and the risk is very small because there is no U.S. nexus. And now suddenly we get the FFI uh, executive order, which makes it clear that if you are involved in a transaction which is related to the Russian military industrial complex, even if there's no U.S. nexus whatsoever, you're in trouble, potentially in trouble. And so my question, and this is the question I will lead to our friend Talia Thompson, who will, for those of you who don't work with her until now, shame on you, but but uh, <laughs> she is my favorite friend in this area in the United States, and she knows it, will be, should we be thinking of maybe changing our methodologies in this respect as a result of the new FFI uh, executive order? Final point. Um, there are many questions here on which we will not be able to give you answers. Why? Because we don't know. And the FAQs that the US government has issued are only partially helpful on these questions, and, and usually there's no way to get answers. I may be able to get some answers in the next few weeks because I may be meeting with the US government on some of these issues in a different context. And if that does happen, then maybe we'll get additional answers. But unless that happens, and until that happens, our best bet is to hear from uh, the US experts. And Talia, that is your cue. So <laughs> I will hand over to you. And the plan is that Talia will take us through this. And after that, we will open it up to any questions you may have in the public arena. So thank you, right. Talia, over to you. Thank you very much, Daniel. And thanks everyone for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. I, I know I have worked with some of you, not all of you, um, but um, yeah, you will know where to find me after this if you have questions that we can't answer <laughs> during the session. So I agree with everything that Daniel said. This is a really complicated moment in Israeli-US relations. And we are seeing an unprecedented shift in terms of the number of regulatory actions specifically targeting uh, Israel, or even if Israel, even if the Israeli flag is not explicitly on the action, clearly having Israel in mind. So, you know, it's the, the temperature is hot and that creates increased risk uh, for everybody. I also agree with Daniel that of the four things that happened, and, and here is just a slide uh, summarizing those four things, the one that creates the most risk uh, for foreign financial institutions, including Israeli banks, is this one. This is the executive order Daniel mentioned, issued in 2023, just before Christmas last year, that uh, authorizes the US government to impose sanctions on foreign financial institutions, including banks, insurance companies, and others, but for your purposes, Israeli banks, uh, that support transactions involving the Russian military industrial complex. Uh, and that is, to answer uh, Daniel's big question, I think this does require a significant change in how banks do business in the category of situations where there isn't any direct connection to the United States, there isn't exposure for violating sanctions, but there is exposure for doing something that the US government dislikes enough to consider imposing sanctions on the bank. It's not the first time the US government has done something like this, send uh, a message to foreign financial institutions that they shouldn't do certain categories of transactions. There are authorities like that uh, with respect to Iran. It's not a big issue for Israeli banks because of course Iran's an enemy state and you have your own reasons for avoiding facilitating any possible transaction involving Iran. Uh, but this is different because it involves Russia and Israeli companies have historically a lot of relationships with Russia. So I'm gonna focus on that and then we'll come back and talk about uh, some of the other actions, but I'm just gonna skip ahead. We can circulate this PowerPoint. It's really just so that you have something to refer back to. Um, we're not gonna go slavishly through it slide by slide. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about an executive order um, that was issued in December and it really has two parts. The, the purpose of this order is that the US government has realized that all of its sanctions on Russia, all of the EU sanctions on Russia, the Japanese, the Australian, the Canadian, all of the multilateral sanctions on Russia have not prevented Russia from getting hold of what it needs to continue prosecuting the war in Ukraine. It has, they have had effects. It's much harder for, for Russia to get a hold of the electronics and other things that it needs. But the, the US government is still seeing a supply of those items to Russia. And so in order to try and stop that happening, 
they are using the big hammer on financial institutions, which are, of course, the linchpin of the supply chain, to try to uh, enroll the financial institutions, the foreign financial institutions, in cutting off the supply of products to Russia. That's the key aim. It's not the only, only risk here, but it is the key aim. So there are two aspects uh, to the executive order, one of which is easier to deal with and one of which is much harder to deal with and will require changes in compliance uh, approaches. The first is that the executive order prohibits significant transactions for specially designated nationals, SDNs, who were designated by the US government for their activity in technology sector, the defense sector, the construction sector, the aerospace sector, or the manufacturing sector. And it's possible that in future, the US government will add additional sectors. Um, now, if you were going to try to comply with this, you would have to not do transactions on behalf of SDNs if they were in the relevant sectors. For the most part, foreign banks, including Israeli banks, don't process transactions on behalf of SDNs anyway. And so you don't care what sector they were designated for operating in. They're an SDN. You probably are not processing transactions for them anyway. But if you were processing to, to process a transaction for an SDN, perhaps because it's in the third bucket where there's no US nexus, you've convinced yourself no US employees are involved, no US dollars are involved, no US systems are involved, and perhaps this SDN is a longstanding uh, client of, of, of the bank, uh, you might have concluded previously that there, there was little risk to doing it. The new risk would be that you could face secondary sanctions if that SDN was one of the SDNs in this category. They were added to the list because they were involved in the aerospace sector in Russia, for example. Um, in order to know that, you would have to look at the Federal Register Notice or the OFAC press release. There is no designator on the SDN list that tells you why they were designated. So if you are considering uh, processing a transaction for an SDN, you're going to have to do some diligence to figure out uh, whether they were added for this for this reason or not. OFAC has said they will update the SDN list, but who knows when that will happen. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, and it's already been nearly three months. So, you know, we could we could be waiting a long time before they do that. It, it is important to note that the transaction does have to be significant. It's not all transactions on behalf of these SDNs. The problem is that the definition of significant uh, includes as a factor whatever OFAC thinks is significant, but any factor that OFAC deems relevant. And so it's impossible to know for sure which transactions OFAC would and wouldn't deem significant. I'm not going to dwell on this because I think as a matter of policy, most of you are not processing transactions for SDNs. Um, the only thing I will add is that a transaction related to family maintenance so if the Israeli government requires you to allow an SDN to withdraw shekels in order to keep food on the table for their family, it's almost certain that the US government would not consider that to be a significant transaction, and that would not expose you to secondary sanctions risk under the new executive order. So let's talk about the real meat of this, the really big problem for foreign financial institutions. That is that the order uh, says that you can be exposed to having sanctions imposed on you that the US government will put you on the list or will more likely, it's usually the first step, prevent uh, US banks from maintaining correspondent accounts for you, which of course is economic death in, a, in our global economy. So prevent US banks from maintaining correspondent accounts for you if you engage in significant transactions or services involving excuse me, involving the Russian military industrial base. That is the text from the regulation, involving the Russian military industrial base. That is a very broad prohibition. Uh, now, it includes two parts. The first part, which they specifically call out, is the sale or supply to Russia, directly or indirectly via a third country, of particular types of items. Those items are laid out in a list that they publish, here it is. So if a foreign bank permits a transaction, say to, mm, let's say to Armenia, okay, Armenia is a high risk of diversion to Russia. It's one of the countries that has been identified as a risk of diversion. For numerically controlled machine tools going to Armenia, uh, and it turns out that they then go on to Russia, the bank could be, if it's a large enough transaction or if it's a frequent enough transaction, if it otherwise 
uh, strikes OFAC as significant, then the bank could uh, could be exposed to the risk that OFAC will say, U.S. banks, you can't maintain a correspondent account for this Israeli bank any longer. So the first part requires banks to foreign banks to prevent transactions involving these particular items. And this is the easy part. Of course, it's not easy. How do you identify transactions involving these items? It's usually not going to be obvious from even a text search of the message transfer, uh, the MTS message. Uh, so how will you know? Basically, the bottom line is the US government's going to expect any transaction going for a lot involving Russia or a country that has been identified as a high risk of diversion to Russia, and we can talk about which countries those are, the bank is going to look at that and, and, and ask for invoices, ask for underlying documentation to see whether it could involve any of these types of products going, going to Russia. Uh, so that's a change, right? You can't just rely on scanning the MTS message. Uh, that it, the the expectation would, would would require additional diligence into those transactions, at least if they could be significant. Uh, now, significance, as I said, a very open-ended concept. OFAC can decide that anything is significant, but historically, the position they've taken is that it depends on how much, how the the size of the transaction, the frequency of the transaction, uh, whether the transaction could be deceptive. So if it's going to a third country with the intent to go to Russia, that would be evasion. And so that would be deceptive. Um, it's very difficult for the bank up front to decide whether something could be significant. And so really the only safe thing to do would be to look at all transactions involving uh, transfers to Russia or to these, to these uh, dodgy countries and check whether they involve uh, those items. That's the easier part. The second part <laughs> is... Uh, excuse me, sorry, I've had this wrong <laughs> and this results in a silly cough. Um, transactions involving the Russian industrial military base. Now, the definition in the FAQs is that Russia's industrial military base, military industrial base, includes the defense sector, the technology sector, the construction sector, the aerospace sector, and the manufacturing sector of Russia. Well, that's almost everything. Um, and there are definitions of each of those sectors, and they are broad. The technology sector is any any part of the Russian economy involving electronics or software or other types of high tech items. The aerospace, obviously, commercial and military uh, aircraft and uh, and and air aircraft services, uh, manufacturing, any kind of manufacturing. So. Those sectors, when you look at the definitions in the FAQs, they include the receipt of goods as well as the provision of goods. This is a big problem because it leaves banks wondering, do we have to monitor not only exports to Russia or possible exports to Russia, but do we also have to monitor procurement from Russia, procurement from the Russian manufacturing center sector, the Russian aerospace sector, the Russian technology sector, and on the text of the of the EO and the supporting FAQs, it appears that the answer is yes. OFAC could take the position that procurement of goods from Russia is uh, subject to the executive order, meaning that banks have to pay attention to the sell side and the buy side in these sectors. But of course, those sectors are enormous, and so it would basically be uh, pretty much any transaction involving involving Russia, inwards or outwards. Now, again, it has to be significant. So, you know, if you have a client that is um, has one employee in Russia and they are providing technology services, maybe they're writing code for, for, for software from Russia and they're paying them a small amount of money, that is not going to be a significant transaction in OFAC's determination. What the government is really trying to do is cut off the supply chain to Russia. So the focus will be more on the sell side exports into Russia. That's the priority. That's clearly what the US government has as a first top of mind intention uh, to prevent. But the executive order gives the government room to crack down on the sell side. If Russian entities are making a lot of money by selling certain products into Israel, a bank would be well advised to avoid supporting those transactions because the US government wants to cut off the flow of dollars or other currencies into Russia, as well as 
the flow of products into Russia. And they have room to do that. It's not their first line of attention. The first thing they're focusing on is sanctions evasion, moving product into Russia, but they have the wiggle room under the executive order to target procurement uh, as well. I'm going to pause there to see if there are any questions so far about this executive order. <laughs> and, and just to say, if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A and we'll read them and reverse them. While we wait to see if anyone has any questions, Talia, um, we had this discussion about exports and imports uh, a few weeks ago after the executive order came out. And I asked you, is it possible to get a clarification from OFAC with respect to its application on exports from Russia to a country like Israel? And if I remember correctly, you said, theoretically, we can ask a question, but I can't guarantee that they'll give an answer at all or an answer which will we understand. Or has your analysis changed since we last talked? No, so I mean, it's pretty standard with OFAC that if you request an advisory opinion, we ask them to clarify. If you ask that formally, it takes forever to get a response. I mean, literally forever, six months, a year, three years, five years can go by before they respond to you. You can ask informally, and that's usually the most productive way to find out. But OFAC has been very cagey about uh, Russia related uh, interpretations because they want to lead, they don't want to be committed. They want to have the wiggle room to up the stakes and increase the pressure as the geopolitical situation evolves. Um, and here where the text gives them the ability to target procurement, I'm pretty sure what they would tell us is that they are interested in significant purchases from Russia because that creates a significant boost to the Russian economy. And the US government's interest is in undermining that. Doesn't mean that all procurement from Russia of anything, if you're buying you know, toilet paper in small quantities from Russia, that's not a significant transaction. But if somebody is buying large quantities of steel from Russia and paying a large amount of money for that, that could be of interest to the US government. And I don't think we'll get any clarification to the contrary. Okay, thank you. And in the related question, um, you and I have had the discussion many times on the question of what is a significant transaction. And the answer I, which stayed with me until today is whatever OFAC decides is a significant transaction. That's, that's right. So, do we have any guidance we can give the Israeli financial institutions with respect to what isn't significant? I mean, uh, because otherwise, knowing the way financial institutions handle such events, uh, they will be scared to touch even a small transaction just because, and legitimately scared, because who knows what OFAC will say. Right. So, anything we can say on this? Yeah, so there is a definition of significant. As you correctly point out, it includes such factors as OFAC deems relevant, but it does also include the size, the number, the frequency of the transaction, whether the transaction is deceptive, how likely it is to undermine US sanctions. And in practice, you, when you think about the transaction, if it's a very small, it's a $20 transaction, it's a $200 transaction, it's maybe $3,000, these are not going to be considered significant unless there are a hundred three thousand dollar transactions in a row. So the size does really matter, the size and the frequency. And how likely it is to undermine the goal of the sanction is also very relevant. So as I mentioned, if you're you have a company that is employing one web designer who happens to live in Russia and they're sending that person a normal salary for that activity, it's not really, uh, it's not promoting the Russian economy. It's not fueling Russia's ability to continue prosecuting the war in Ukraine. It's not a significant contributor to the Russian economy. That would not be considered significant. But there isn't any concrete guidance. It really is a case-by-case -case determination about whether if you were OFAC and your mission was to, to bring about the end of the war in Ukraine through US sanctions, would you consider that transaction to be significant? Um, so to so. follow up on that, Talia, before I get to the first question from the audience, um, if a bank or a financial institution has a <laughs> transaction which it is considering whether it may or may not be significant, would OFAC accept a self-assessment 
if it's a reasonable one, a sufficient basis for a decision? Or would the bank be better served if it wanted to move forward if they received formal written advice from U.S. counsel saying, we think this is not significant given OFAC's guidance? Would that be a better approach for a financial institution to take if they want to stay safe? Well, much as I love to bill, 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 um, I'm going to say that it isn't necessary to get uh, an opinion from U.S. counsel. Um, OFAC certainly will. It's not that they accept either one, right? It's a mitigating factor. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. Uh, but if you can show that you thought carefully about it and you considered relevant factors and you memorialize that in an internal memorandum, that is going in OFAC's mind, that would be almost as good, if not as good, as an opinion from U.S. counsel. Um, getting many U.S. lawyers to commit to whether something is significant or not might also be a challenge uh, and could, could be very expensive. And so um, I think in many cases, an internal memo would be sufficient. If it's very, very high stakes and you're really not sure, then you may want to consult a U.S. lawyer to, who in most cases is probably going to confirm your intuition that it is it is dangerous uh, and that might be important for other reasons important in talking to your stakeholders important in making the business understand why this transaction can't go through important in making an israeli court understand it there may be other reasons to go to outside counsel but i don't think it's necessary in every case so moving to the first question we received from an anonymous attendee knowing the nature of Many of the participants on the call, I'm not surprised that the attendee is anonymous. And the question is, are we only concerned about activity in or out of Russia? Or could it also apply to activities with third countries, I'm translating this, which could eventually benefit Russia? In other words, indirect trade with Russia. Good question. Yes. So certainly does apply to potential indirect transfers. The 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 um if you are aware that a company is active in a sector of the Russian economy uh, in another country, then that could be an issue. And if you are aware particularly, I mean, the really highest risk is if there is a transaction involving items going into Russia um, and it's, it's not going into Russia, it's going into Armenia or it's going to Azerbaijan or it's going to Turkey or it's going to Cyprus or it's going to... In some cases, uh, there have been uh, transfers from uh, other jurisdictions like India or China. Those are high risk because if the items end up in Russia and if the US government identifies a, an evasion chain, a smuggling chain going through those countries, then the bank will, will, will be considered to have been on notice that this could be a transaction involving the Russian in, industrial military industrial base. So it really, this is why I say I do think that this requires a change in compliance procedures. There is a risk that if you were to uh, engage in a high value transaction to China, let's say, for electronics, if there is any red flag that, that, that the ultimate destination is Russia, that's good. That, that is exposing the bank to risk. Now, if you can show that you did a reasonable amount of due diligence, you followed ordinary practices, you reviewed all the documentation available to you, uh, then, it's not likely that the US government will immediately impose sanctions on the bank and cut off access to all correspondent accounts. But if there were a series of such transactions, then the risk that the US bank, that the US government says, you're just not a responsible partner and we need to make an example, goes up. What about if the transaction is not a circumvention, meaning it will not eventually end up in Russia, for example? but the recipient is part of a Russian group. And so from a monetary perspective, Russia will benefit from it, even though the, the product may actually not go to Russia per se. Would you think that's pushing it too far or is that potentially also in the scope? Yeah, I think that this is a gray area. So the, the executive order covers transactions involving the Russian military industrial base. If you had a large group of companies with a Russian parent and a company in, let's just pick on China again, a company in China uh, that is part of that group, the question would be, are they, do, are they themselves, the company in China, are they supporting the Russian military industrial base? If it's only financial, then 
I think it's lower down the list of priorities. The government has um, a lot of room to interpret this order however they want. And it could be that in the future, they will start going after that kind of scenario. But I don't think it's the priority. On the other hand, if it was a company in China that is known and reported in, in, in the media to be supplying goods to the Russian military, that's much higher risk. Understood. Um, I have two initial questions because I can see the audience is, 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 is I'll say, uh, being very quiet, although they're listening. So my first question is a very hot topic in Israel. And the topic is, how much should Israeli financial institutions be concerned if there's an Israeli FDN who wants to carry out Israeli shekel transactions in Israel? Now, you and I have had this discussion offline, uh, and I will admit that I know that many financial institutions have different policies, and I'm not going to say uh, give anyone marks of who's right, who's wrong. That's not the point. I would like you to share your perspective as to the potential risks in your eyes for Israeli financial institutions if they do carry out Israeli-focused banking activities or services in Israeli shekels for US-designated SDN. Okay. So this is more, more relevant to the West Bank sanctions situation, right? But also oh. to, to the many Russian oligarchs who, uh, who have business interests in Israel and make charitable donations in Israel and, and those kinds of things. So um, in, in, with respect to local shekels transactions in Israel, there are a couple of categories of, uh, of potential transactions. If the SDN is subject to secondary sanctions, so if, for example, they are one of the est a Russian oligarch designated uh, in connection with the Crimea-related uh, sanctions, then there is a secondary sanctions risk. And that will depend on whether the Israeli shekel transaction is significant. If it is a million dollar donation to, to a university, that could be considered significant by the US government because it's a million dollars. On the other hand, it's a donation to the university, maybe not, but probably of significance, okay? If it's to enable them to buy a $500,000 house, that could also be considered significant, right? That's a large amount, that's a large amount of money. If it is business related, large numbers of business transactions enabling that, that SDN to continue in business, that could also be considered significant. But if it's personal maintenance of a reasonable amount, not billionaire luxury lifestyle maintenance, but a reasonable amount of money to keep food on the table, keep the bill, the lights on in their in their in their home, uh, then the US government is not going to consider that to be significant. That's the secondary sanctions risk. There is of course a risk, as you pointed out earlier, if although it's in US shekel, uh, although it's in shekels, excuse me, there is a US nexus. So if you had a US person compliance officer having to approve that transaction, that would be a violation. It might not be a violation that the US government cares about very much, but it would be a violation. And you need that person to be out of the loop. You, know, you can't have any obvious US connections to such transactions. US persons cannot approve them, even if they're for personal maintenance. That There's no exception for that uh, in US regulation. So it is important to map out your systems, make sure there are no clear US nexuses, have a documentation that you did that, that you, you took, uh, you, you, you went through and made sure there were no US nexuses before you engage in even local currency transactions um, with, uh, with SDNs. And then the final risk is not an OFAC risk, it's an other banks risk. You know, banks receive just like every other every other entity, but more more so receive questionnaires from their U.S. correspondents. They you may have contractual obligations not to engage in transactions with SDNs. You may have represented to U.S. banks that you don't engage in any transactions with SDNs. And if you need to give a different answer, like well, sometimes we do, but only if dot dot dot, then you're opening the door to a whole bunch of questions from your U.S. correspondents and your insurance companies and others about whether you're exposing them to risk. And that can actually be much worse than dealing with the OFAC situation or much more complicated. 
Thank you. And a related question we just came in. Um, it's about questionnaires uh, to clients. Because as part of the due diligence process, all of the banks have adopted certain levels of, of questionnaires. And it's a two-part question. First of all, do you think questionnaires should be used only for clients who have foreign trade? Or do you think we actually need to send such questionnaires to all our clients? Uh, uh, even those only operating in the domestic market. Um, and secondly, uh, um, who has to fill out the questionnaire? Uh, as legitimate due diligence, must it be the client or could it be the bank clerk who deals with the client on a regular basis and know the answers and they fill it in or does that, that, that make that unreasonable? Okay, let me take those questions in reverse order. Um, so you should get the information from somebody at the client. What your what the person within the bank knows may be outdated. It may not be accurate. They may think they know something that they don't know. And you don't have, one of the reasons that the government likes you to do this kind of diligence is they like to have a signed document from the entity that is causing the transaction. So, so that they can go after you and they can go after the foreign company that caused you to process the uh, sanctions busting transaction. It's easier for them to do that if they can show that that customer had knowledge, that they misrepresented something to you. It protects you and it and the US government likes it. So they they prefer to have some, it is better to have something signed by the custom the customer. Okay. The second question the or the first question about um whether you sh who should you uh, gather these questionnaires from? Um if your customers have international business, then certainly. Uh, depending on the risk of that international business uh, and the jurisdictions that they are, or the questionnaires may, may you may have a two-phase questionnaire. The first one to assess the risk, and then a follow-up questionnaire if they are if they are in a high-risk area of international transactions. When we talk about customers who only have domestic business, we still have to think about procurement. So it may be that they don't sell internationally, but they might be buying internationally. It would be pretty unusual to have a customer that has absolutely no international footprint. They don't obtain any services or any materials from overseas. And if they are buying internationally, then there can still be risks, um, particularly under the new Russia-related uh, foreign financial institutions um, uh, executive order. And so uh, if you, the question should, before a customer is labeled domestic and therefore completely safe, you want to think about uh, international procurement. Um, but if you did have a customer that was, you know, 100% local, maybe they sell uh, oranges uh, and they get them from Israel and they sell them in Israel to Israelis, then, you know, yes, that would be that would be pretty, pretty low risk unless they are themselves an SDN. Um, it, while we're talking about due diligence, I did want to point out that in connection with the foreign financial uh, institutions, Russia-related military industrial base executive order. OFAC did put out an advisory providing <laughs> guidance for financial institutions. Um, and it does provide some important, and I think in some sense surprising because burdensome, guidance on what kinds of steps banks should take for risk mitigation. This isn't a law. OFAC isn't saying you have to do it, but they are giving you an insight into what, in their minds, they're expecting to see foreign financial institutions do. And these would then be steps that would protect you if you if you had done them and you could show you had done them and you acted reasonably in the light of them. They would give you some protection if OFAC does identify problematic transactions that the bank has processed. So one thing they are asking banks to do is to notify customers that their accounts may not be used to conduct, and this is the language from the advisory, any activity involving Russia's military industrial base. So again, the advisory was not just focusing on purchase, on selling to Russia, but using this very broad language, any activity involving the military industrial base. They have advised that the bank should engage in uh, enhanced trade finance reviews, so any kind of trade finance targeting Russia or uh, with parties in Russia or the diversion risk countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Cyprus, et cetera, the, whatever review you're doing of trade finance documents should be doubled uh, to make sure that there really isn't any indication of, of, a, of sanctions evasion or export control evasion. Identifying customers, actively going out, looking at your customer base, 
and identifying the customers that deal in the listed items or in the sectors of the Russian economy that have been identified as problematic, like construction, for example, and then sending questionnaires to, to uh, better understand the business. This is all in the advisory from OFAC. This is not stuff I'm making up. Um, and then conducting proactive investigations into possible sanctions and export control evasion. I mean, this is one of those unrealistic, I think, uh, suggestions by OFAC, because uh, as if you didn't have enough on your hands just trying to deal with uh, daily transactions to actually go and, and look. But it helps you understand the mindset of the regulator, that they, that they are contemplating that banks might, uh, might do this. And then if you do identify risk, then, the, then OFAC's expectation would be that the bank would take steps to address it. That might be restricting accounts. It might be limiting what the company or the individual can do with that account in order to mitigate the risk. Uh, and if a client is just non-cooperative, they won't respond, they don't respond, they, they don't provide uh, a fulsome accounting in response to your questionnaires, OFAC would also consider that to be a red flag. And according to the guidance, they're going to expect the bank to take some action. So this does, I think, suggest a different approach. It's not enough to just rely on screening of the MTS messages, making sure that the parties are not subject to sanctions. They really are expecting a, a thorough uh, effort on behalf of foreign banks to cut off uh, Russia's access to the things that it, it needs to support the, the military effort. Um, and as I said, clearly a priority on the inward side to Russia, but also some risk on the procurement side, at least for high value transactions of strategic goods. One so quick follow up question on that one. And we have three more questions after that. So people have started being active. Um, the follow up question is, do you think the risk to the bank applies even if the, the uh, foreign trade isn't handled by that bank, but that bank only handles the domestic accounts? and the uh, foreign traders in another bank, and they're just getting the proceeds. Um, so, so <laughs> yes, I think a bank that, um, that receives the proceeds of sanctions violating transactions or sanctions busting transactions would be at risk. It's a lower risk because it's not directly facilitating the trade, but OFAC takes a very expansive view of facilitation to include situations where after the fact you receive uh, you receive the proceeds so it's a lower risk but if you know that your client is, in, is selling the kinds of goods that OFAC worries about to Russia and you're receiving the proceeds of that you're not protected understood so let let's move to some of the other questions which are all of them are good First of all, a question which is usually not asked by banks. So this is probably an anonymous attendee from an insurance company or <laughs> investment uh, bankers or something, because you can see it from the question. And the question is, does the nationality of any of the directors or the officers, uh, uh, does it impact on the analysis? So obviously, we're not talking about someone who is actually involved in the transaction, because that is an obvious no-no if there's a U.S., sanctions violation, you can't have a US person involved in that transaction. So I assume the question is, what about other officers of the company and or directors? Would they somehow taint the organization by their presence? So for, for purposes of, the, of what we've been primarily talking about, the, the, the Foreign Financial Institutions Executive Order, it doesn't matter because this applies even if there's no connection to the US, okay? So everything we've been talking about there, it, ma it doesn't matter. If we were thinking about the West Bank sanctions, which are a standard list-based sanctions, that now there are some more Israeli SDNs, then as you point out, having a US person involved in the transaction is an obvious no-no. But it's also uh, the case that if somebody has to approve the transaction, it's a no-no if they're a US person. Um, if you just have a U.S. person on the board, one you know one of the board members happens to be a U.S. person, then the relevance would be whether they approve the policy that allows a certain transaction. So if you have a policy that says, uh, in certain circumstances, we will do business with SDNs, your board member, who's a U.S. person, cannot approve that. So you would have to have a recusal policy that allows those board members to recuse themselves. Uh, if by recusing themselves, they if the board happens to be structured in such a way that 
that, you know, maybe it's three U.S. persons and three Israelis. And when the U.S. persons recuse themselves, it makes it possible for the Israelis to vote yes. In theory, OFAC could take the position that that is also facilitation. They have uh, provided crazier guidance in the past, but it's unlikely that it would ever come to light. I mean, it's not like a, a key risk. So, but you should have a recusal policy to avoid U.S. persons in positions like the board approving policies that are not consistent with U.S. sanctions. I agree, and that is what we've been advising companies also to make sure that everyone knows that U.S. persons cannot be involved in these procedures. Um, yeah. Another question which relates to the significance test, that impossible question, um, and they're bringing a specific example. Let's assume an Israeli SDN <laughs> has funds in long-term saving, let's say a pension uh, fund or something like that, and the question is, the investment firm or insurance company which is managing that, and they want, let's say, to disperse the pension or whatever, could they be at risk of being viewed as violating U.S. sanctions because they're giving the person the money back or paying them yes. the money salary? So, yes. I mean, if there's a U.S. nexus and the insurance, the, well, if, if the insurance company is a U.S. insurance company, it can't dispense the funds. But if we're talking about... Um, uh, right, a non-US company, and the question is whether it's a significant transaction, it depends on the value. If they're making a small payment on a monthly basis, and they're not dispersing hundreds of thousands of dollars, then it's probably not significant. <laughs> it would be more like the personal maintenance uh, type situation that we, met, we mentioned before. But if they're cashing out the entire pension plan, or if the pension plan is such an enormous plan that it's paying out $10,000 a month, that's significant over time. The it, one ten thousand dollar transaction might not be, but a whole series of them uh, would potentially be significant. Um, so, you know, is it the top priority of of, of OFAC for enforcement? No, but could it, if it came to their attention, uh, be a problem? Yes. I have to tell you that my instinct is that if this is a pension plan which that person has had for twenty years in that bank or the investment of unit, I think it's a low risk to disperse it, but it's not a zero risk. And as you know, many of the clients on the call don't like even small risks. So I think- And, and again, it's it's the, there's the OFAC risk on the one hand. It, I mean, it is important to bear in mind that they use the secondary sanctions authority very sparingly. They 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 very rarely, even, the, even this Russia type secondary sanctions where they have the choice not just putting you on the list, but cutting off correspondent accounts. They don't do it very often. Uh, and many banks process, you know, many banks who are less compliant process significant transactions for all kinds of bad actors, uh, and don't get don't get whacked by OFAC. So in the grand scheme of things, it's a it's a fairly low risk. I do think the bigger risk is problems with your correspondence. If they find out that you are regularly doing business with SDNs, uh, even if it's not significant, the correspondent may decide that it. Pr that, that your compliance procedures are not adequate and therefore you present risk to them and they may, as a matter of contract, decide that they just don't want to be your correspondent. So the biz there's business risk separate from the OFAC risk. Understood. And we have a follow-up question on the due diligence requirements. Someone here correctly says, it seems clear that we now need to know who the customer's customer is. And the question they're asking, how far should we go down this rabbit hole uh, uh, until it's deemed reasonable? In other words, do we need to follow it all the way through? Or if we do one or two leaps and we are confident that there are no red flags of, of something bad down the chain, that we can stop there? I mean, is there any guidance on how deep we need to go? Their OFAC is very reluctant to provide any such guidance. They always just say it depends on the risk. Um, and so, but as a practical matter, <laughs> if it if 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 you are the originating bank and your customer is the one buying the services or providing the services, um, then you have a higher obligation than when you're just an intermediary bank. That's clear. You have to go further because you have more access to information, more ability to ask for the information from your customer. And if your customer, it, but if you ask your customer, they identify the customer. If it's clear that their customer is just an intermediary, the, the type of, you know, they're selling to a trading company or they're selling to an integrator, then you would be expected to ask your customer if they know who the ultimate end user is. 
but if there are no if you've done you've gone through the normal motions if it was an integrator you asked the customer and they told you yes that here's the end user and there are no they give you the certificate that they have they uh, and there are no red flags in the public domain about any of the entities you wouldn't and you're not you wouldn't be expected to go further than that. And if it turns out that it was a mistake, but you've done the normal diligence and you've recorded it, OFAC is not going to, is certainly not going to impose sanctions on a bank for that. There can be liability if there's a US nexus, there can be civil liability on a strict liability basis, even if you did everything right. But it typically doesn't happen with one transaction. You have to have a whole bunch of situations where, and that usually means that there was some flaw in the diligence more generally. So very low risk. Thank you. And the final <laughs> question before we end this session, and it relates to the example you gave earlier about someone buying or uh, selling oranges in Israel, which are grown in Israel, et cetera. And so the question is, when we look at the FFI executive order, can't we sort of create a list of industries and sectors which are very low risk because they are not related to the Russian military industrial complex and therefore we don't need to do detailed due diligence and questionnaires, et cetera, for this purpose in those sectors. Would that be a reasonable approach or one possible approach to decrease the scope of due diligence that the bank has to do? Yes, I think that would that would be reasonable with the caveat that the, the current list of sectors that are considered military industrial might expand over time, um, but it's probably not going to encompass agriculture, for example. Uh, and so, you know, as, a, you can probably make a good guess now, and B, you keep a, you you monitor the situation, and you may have to revisit your procedures later if something changes. Thank you, Talia. And with that, we've answered all the questions you've been brave enough to send us, and we've finished giving you free advice. <laughs> so uh, uh, I assume there will be follow up questions from many of our clients on the call, and we will be very happy to field them on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, so obviously that option is open, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Talia, for making yourself available uh, for this session, which is in a very trying period where actually being a compliance officer or legal uh, officer in one of these financial institutions with all of these things happening at the same time is a very trying experience and even helping a little bit i think goes a long way so thank you very much for this that's my my great pleasure and my my sympathy to everybody because just when we had recovered from the wave of 2022 2023 russia craziness other craziness happened i, I know it's been very hard so my pleasure thank you for the opportunity Thank you all, and I hope you, everyone, got some input and some important insight from this session. So thank you, and a good rest and of the week to everyone else.